Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's show. It's time for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Hi, everybody. Glad that you could be here to join us for another edition of our Lunchtime program brought to you by the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality and a broadcast service of us here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. It's good to be with everybody. Every Wednesday at noon, we bring you exciting people doing interesting things out there in the world of science, education, technology, math, art. I don't know. We talk about all kinds of great things here on this program, all to give all of us environmental educators, professionals, and the public great insight into what's happening in science and nature across the state of North Carolina. If you're watching today on YouTube, know that you can interact with us and today's guest speakers throughout the program. Uh, drop your questions for our guest speakers as we go. As you have questions, type them up, put them into the chat box on YouTube. That's where when it's time for the audience question and answer session towards the end of the program, I'll be looking for your thoughts, your comments, and your questions to pose to today's guest speakers. So make sure you're in the chat, chat it up, get chatty, so that we've got a great dialogue at the end of the show. Same thing if you're watching over on Facebook, know that you can type up your thoughts and questions into the comments there uh, next to the video and join our conversation as well. The Lunchtime Discovery Series is interactive. My name is, uh, by the way, if you didn't already know, I'm Chris, I'm your host, I work here at the museum uh, and you can find me here with the Lunchtime Series every week. But the real people that you want to meet today are today's guest speakers. First off, let me introduce Caitlin Roberts and Jessica Metz. Hi, you two. Shio. Shio. Hello. It's great for, uh, to, to meet the two of you. Everybody, Jessica and Caitlin, are teachers at Nukadua Academy in Cherokee, North Carolina. An absolutely gorgeous city and gorgeous part of the state. How are things out there in Cherokee? They're beautiful today, but it's been a little cloudy and rainy the past couple of days. Oh, is that right? <laughs> we're just happy to be live in person with students, really, right? Yeah, we're very happy about that. <laughs> you know, I was actually talking to some some other educators from all across North Carolina just a, a couple of weeks ago. And they expressed the same sentiment. They were very excited to be back in the classrooms with students doing the oh so important job of educating. So uh, I'm very excited about today's presentation where we get to hear a little bit about uh, the work that you're doing, uh, but also this, this idea that's become increasingly popular and important in decolonizing science and the importance of indigenous knowledge and where it intersects with science. So I'm gonna turn it over to the two of you and let you start the educating. Okay, thank you. Excellent. She only got Waisha, a week ago, God, dog with doa, a degadu, a tali ne, degadeo hushko, aya ani talagi. Hello, everyone. My name is Caitlin Roberts. I am a second grade teacher at Nugadua Academy in Cherokee, North Carolina, and I am an enrolled member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. <laughs> like our smooth transition there. We'll get back to it. Um, Shio, Jessica Metz, Ale Shkoi Dagwado, Galieli Ga, Ate Gadua, Didelo Guasti, Degada Yohashko, Gadelo Gua, Agawona Histi Zalagi. I'm Jessica Metz. I am this year, I am the third and fourth grade English language arts, science and social studies teacher at Nugadua Academy. Um, I am learning to speak Cherokee language. I am not indigenous, but I am so grateful to have spent almost 20 years now as a teacher here in the Cherokee community. Um, so this is us. Uh, 
Nugadua Academy is the Cherokee Language Immersion School for the Eastern Band of Cherokee. Um, we are right outside the entrance to Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which basically just means we get to chase elk off of the playground and out of our gardens. Um, we have about 60 students and 16 staff in the K-6 program, but we also have an early childhood part of our program where students start as early as one year old. Um, we work to maintain a full immersion model uh, through second grade, and then as the students get older up through sixth grade, we continue to integrate more English so that they can transition um, to surrounding schools. Um, part of our mission is also to integrate Cherokee culture into the mandated standards uh, for North Carolina. And one way that we do that is by using indigenous stories. Um, you will hear both of us say the words class and students um, a lot. And I know a lot of you are probably non-formal educators, but I've also worked as a non-formal educator. And I think that a lot of this stuff can double for both situations. So don't get turned off if you hear us just say students and lessons and class, but because this is so much bigger than that. And I hope you'll hang in there with us. Should I go to the next one or leave it on this one? That's what you're talking about. Yeah, do that okay. one. So today I wanna to talk about indigenous stories, their importance and what role they play in contemporary science instruction. Since I am Cherokee, I will be talking specifically about Cherokee stories, but my hope is that the information I share with you all today will give you a framework for thinking about indigenous stories as a whole and how they can be useful in planning instruction and activities for learners from all backgrounds, not just indigenous students. First, I wanna talk about the role that stories play in Cherokee society. Stories were based on observations made about the world around us and stories were how we passed down these observations and what we had learned about the world through generations. Because of the importance of these stories, storytellers play a special role in our society. They are our historians. So this slide uh, just features some pictures of contemporary Eastern band storytellers. All right, now, Caitlin and I would love to have all the time and space to deep dive into our favorite stories with you all today. Um, I put the possum tail up because I'm a little bit obsessed with possums. So I, the possum stories are always my favorite. He is cute, but you know there's trouble when he's got the soft fuzzy tail on the front of the book. Um, but unfortunately today, we're just going to kind of summarize the stories as we go. But just know that our contact information will be at the end of this. And we are totally willing to help share lots of favorite resources um, to get these stories in a lot of different formats, including like individual picture books or anthologies, educator guides, videos, lots of different ways. So um, just Understand that that's why we're not sharing complete stories with you today. Thanks. So the first story I'm gonna discuss is the story of the origin of strawberries because it is a great example of a Cherokee story that shows how we made observations about our world and how those observations shaped our understanding of the world. There's a few different versions of this story, but in each version, a husband and wife get into an argument that always results in the woman getting upset and storming off. In a version of this story told by Kathy Littlejohn, everywhere the woman steps as she is running away, strawberry blossoms pop up. These blossoms lead the man to the woman where he apologizes to her. As the man and woman are walking home, the blossoms become strawberries. Today, strawberries remind us not to fight with our loved ones. In Davy Arch's retelling, the man and woman get into an argument and the woman storms off. The man starts to miss her, so he prays to the creator to bring the woman back to him. Creator plants strawberries on the trail leading the woman back to her home. She starts to follow the trail of strawberries home, eating them on the way. She is eventually led back home where the man apologizes to her and they reunite. 
In this story, we are told that strawberries are the very first berry to bloom in the spring because they were the first berry that creator gave to man. In Freeman Owl's version, the wife asked her husband to go hunting and bring her back a deer for dinner that night because her mother was coming to visit. We can all relate to that, wanting to impress the mother-in-law, right? right? While hunting, the husband comes across a hunter who has fallen in a ravine. He stops to rescue the other hunter and carries him back to the village. By the time he is done rescuing the man, it is dark and all the deer have bedded down for the night. He goes home to tell his wife what happened, but before, she, before he can, she gets angry and runs off. The husband prays to the creator to slow the woman down so he can catch up to her and explain why he did not get a deer. So the creator puts blossoms down in her path. This does not slow the woman down, so the creator puts fruit trees in front of her. This doesn't slow her down either. She just walks around them. So finally, he puts down strawberries. The smell makes her stop and start to eat them. The husband is able to catch up to her where he explains what happened. The woman apologizes for storming off and they return home. Cherokee saw that wild strawberries were the first berries to sprout in the spring and they believe this was why. We learn about how Cherokees were able to identify plants by the white strawberry blossoms. In the stories, the man and woman are both observing the natural world around them. They see, taste, and smell. So in addition to that awesome content connection that Caitlin shared with us, um, you can also plant and eat strawberries. Hello. We like we we did. Yes, of course. Um, but plant stories are so rich with all kinds of science um, in several of the versions uh, what the way the creator is referred to is it's also referred to as the sun or that she storms off towards the east where the sun was rising. And so there are so many ways you can dive into the, the fact that the plants needed the sun to be able to grow, uh, photosynthesis, the parts of the plant with the different plant blossoms and fruit. Um, all of those are ways you can kind of dig into that, that strawberry story. Now, on top of that, here's some representations of some of my other favorite stories. Um, the tobacco story is a story where a little hummingbird is the one that is able to rescue the tobacco plant being held hostage by a bunch of mean geese, because we all know geese are mean. Um, but it, it quickly shows that the hummingbird knew not only that how to save that plant so we can make that pollinator connection. But that hummingbird knew exactly what parts of the plant, the flower and the seeds to get to be able to reproduce that plant. Um, the story of the fall leaves down at the bottom there. Um, if you've been in presentations with me before, you've probably heard this story. This is one of my favorites. I call this the middle school slumber party story because the creator asked the trees to stay awake for seven days and seven nights. And we all know bad things happen to the first person that falls asleep at a slumber party. So the first trees that fell asleep uh, lost their hair, their leaves, and uh, were unable to um, keep them through the year. Then the trees that stayed awake for all seven days were able to stay green or keep their hair all year long. Um, this is just one of those beautiful examples of teaching a scientific concept without scientific vocabulary. Uh, that story never says deciduous and evergreen anywhere in it. And yet those concepts are so clear. Um, the Shalu story, which is the top uh, right picture there, uh, the drawing, Shalu was the first woman and she was known to kind of have magical powers. Um, her sons thought she was a witch and that did not go well for her. Um, but the, the story is that she could rub her belly and fill a basket with corn. She would scratch her armpits and she could fill a basket with beans. Um, and so again, that goes right into the three sisters garden, which teaches very quickly and easily the nitrogen cycle um, and tells us about how some plants are nitrogen fixers and why certain plants can be grown together or should be grown together. Um, just a, a nice, way to bring that story again back that is so rich with science and has been passed on through generations because this is knowledge that was needed. They needed to know how to cultivate the corn and when to plow it and how to pollinate it. Um, 
they needed to know what the important parts of the plant were to be able to reproduce um, those those gardens. Um, again, this is also the we have done it here in the classroom and with our school garden. This could easily translate to anybody who has community gardens, anybody who's teaching about plants, whether they're um, you know agricultural plants or whether they're plants in the wild. <laughs> Another traditional Cherokee story of the first ball game shows us how our ancestors observed animal adaptations. In this story, the birds and the land mammals are going to have a stickball game. Stickball is a game similar to lacrosse. The humble bat, who at that time did not have any wings, asks to play for the land mammals, but they tell him that he is too little to play with them. The bat, still determined to play, then ask the birds if he can play for them instead. The birds agree, but they have to fashion makeshift wings for the bat out of an old drum head. At this point, they have just one day before the ball game, so they frantically teach the bat how to fly with his new wings. During the ball game the next day, the little bat with his new wings and less than stellar flying abilities <laughs> actually scores the winning goal for the winged animals. This story is a great example of how Cherokees integrated both scientific and ethical knowledge into storytelling. We learn why the bat flitters to and fro when it flies with seemingly no pattern. This story shows that my ancestors had seen a bat up close. They knew its leathery wings resembled buckskin. It shows that we knew the bat was not a bird. Finally, it teaches us that even the smallest of creatures can make the biggest difference. This is a very common theme among Cherokee stories. So in the classroom, the animal stories are where I was first introduced to the whole idea of teaching um, traditional science concepts through story. To, through story. Um, the animal stories are my favorite. I mean, they are just, they are fun. There are silly characters. They're fun to act out. Many of them are written with direct dialogue between the animals, again, that's like so fun for the kids to act out. Um, you can use crazy voices if you're reading aloud. Um, some of my favorites are uh, that are represented here. Uh, why the deer's teeth are blunt, obviously. And this is like a great way where you can go into as shallow or as deep as you want. Um, you can say, yes, deer has flat teeth, bear has sharp teeth. Yeah. Okay. Or you can go as deep as, you know, the evolution of herbivore teeth versus, you know, carnivore teeth or omnivore teeth and how those look different. Um, we have, of course, you knew I'd get the possum in here again. Um, the possum's tail, why the possum's tail is bare, uh, how the turkey got his beard, why the black snake is, why the rat snake there is black. Um, how the red bird got his color. All of these are perfect ways to introduce animal adaptations to students um, and to adults too, really. Like think about those parts of the animal that stand out and how they were useful to the animal and know that these indigenous people were observing and recording this information uh, for generations. Again, it's important information to know so that you can understand the world around you and which is important, which is important for your survival. Um, one thing I will mention is to be uh, careful about cultural mores surrounding certain animals. Um, make sure to know kind of who your audience is, if possible. Um, the, I did not know. <laughs> when I first started working in Cherokee, that there were a lot of um, beliefs around screech owls. That's why I got this little guy. He used to, he passed away a couple of years ago. He's Rasta from the Balsam Mountain Preserve. Um, but he was a little screech owl. And I, being the teacher I am, I like planned a bird show and I was so excited. And they brought all these wonderful raptors for us. And one of the raptors they brought was a screech owl. And as soon as they brought that screech owl out, I had like four or five teachers just get up and leave the presentation. And 
I, at that time, I had no idea that um, they are seen as shapeshifters and omens of bad luck in Cherokee culture. So it was not okay to have a screech owl there <laughs> at the school. Um, I also had a Navajo student or a, a student that was part Navajo. And there are a lot of beliefs around snakes in the Navajo tradition. Um, and so I had to be very careful if we were learning about snakes or um, learning about animals or even in the garden, I uh, had to kind of be aware of that to make sure that that student was um, was respected with their beliefs that way. So just something to kind of keep uh, in mind, just do your research um, and, and keep yourself educated. But I, I highly recommend, because I know a lot of you, again, non-formal educators are out there doing animal programs. I can't tell you how many skins and skulls programs I have done, like starting off with the animal stories. Um, they're again, fun characters, bring your puppets, bring your live animals, like, mm -hmm. and work with those. And it's something that almost every culture in the entire, like, world that we know has animal folklore with observations. And they're local to that area. That's the other important part, I think, for us as educators is these Cherokee stories are about animals that are here that, you know, mm -hmm. have have been here that are native to this area. And so it makes sense that, that to use them as educational tools as well. <laughs> so this picture is not necessarily a story in and of itself, um, but it is an artist's rendition of uh, pre-contact Cherokee cosmology. And I wanted to talk about it just because I love it. I think it's an awesome picture, um, but also because it provides a complete sort of overview of how my ancestors viewed the world around them. And it also provides us with some scientific insights. So Cherokees believed that the world could be divided into thirds, the upper, middle, and lower world. And over here, I have those labeled in Cherokee. So Galaladit, upper, Ayali, middle, and Ayladit, lower. And each part of the world was associated with different animals. So the upper world was associated with the kinds of plants and animals that lived and grew closest to the creator. Eagles, high elevation plants, birds of prey, etc. Because of this, these plants and animals were considered sacred and were revered for those reasons. The middle world is where humans lived and where the upper and lower world meet. Some animals, like the turtle, were revered because they could live in water, which was considered a part of the lower world, and in the middle world. The lower world is where animals like catfish, giant serpents, and otters lived. We can see in this cosmology that my ancestors already had an understanding about the variety of ecosystems that could be found in their homelands. We can see, again, that they understood different animal adaptations enabled different animals to live in different ecosystems. We can see knowledge about the stars, heavens, and we can see how they understood that each organism plays a role in their respective ecosystem. So just to talk about some of the things that are in this picture real quick, um, in the upper world section, we see uh, like a bird man. Um, and then also this is an uctena or a winged serpent. That's a very common, um, motif that you see in a lot of pre-contact southeastern art and then we see in the lower world um this dog looking thing in the center is a water dog and anthropologists actually think that this was an otter because i mean if you were a cherokee person living pre-contact you know you might see an otter and think hey that kind of looks like a dog so that's what we're going to call it All right. So I, I love this, but this is where like we've talked a lot about plants and animals, but what other kind of stuff can we teach? Well, that's when we dig into these, you know, creation stories. Um, the story of how the world was made includes um, buzzard that it's the water beetle brings up, this is the Cherokee creation story. The water beetle brings um, some soft mud up from the bottom of the water and 
as it begins to dry, it's not drying fast enough, and they encourage the buzzard to go fly around and dry it off so that they can have the land to use more quickly. And when he starts to get towards this area of the world, he's getting tired. And so he's like, kind of like close to the ground. And whenever he flaps his wings down, he creates valleys. And when he flaps his wings up, it creates the mountains. Um, what a great place to start talking about plate tectonics um, and talking about how all that works. Um, we, you can also use uh, the first fire story um, is, again, this is one of the like beginning of creation stories. There was no fire. It was dark. I'm not going to tell this story because so many other people tell it a million times better than me. Um, go look up Robert Lewis, who is a Cherokee Nation storyteller. His version of the first fire is my favorite. Um, but it's basically there is a burning tree on an island and the animals are trying to get some of that fire and bring it back so they can have warmth and heat and light. And Eat. many different animals try and get the fire and bring back pieces of it. Uh, but each animal, as they go and try to capture some of that fire, experiences the fire in a different way. Um, and through that, it is perfect examples of thermal dynamics, conduction, convection, radiation. All, each animal, some of them actually touch the fire. Some of them just feel the heat and are, you know, backed off from it. Um, there's lots of, of good examples there. Um, the Milky Way, every culture has star stories. We are all looking at the same stars. And of course, what do we do when we look at the sky as we dream? And so there are star stories from lots of indigenous cultures. Mm -hmm. um, the Milky Way is the one that here in Cherokee, we probably know the best. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just about a dog who likes to snatch food. I mean, <clears throat> we all have dogs that like to snatch food. So for sure, like he, and he ends up running off with some cornmeal and we have the beautiful Milky Way. Uh, the far story, the one with the kind of dirt looking painting over there on the left um, is actually a painting that some of my, one of my students did. Uh, from a story of G Grandfather Rock, where Grandfather and Coyote get in kind of an argument and um, he, the Grandfather Rock rolls down the hill after the Coyote and breaks into little pieces, but then ends up being put back together, which is a beautiful demonstration of the rock cycle also. So as you can see, these stories are not just about plants and animals. There are also lots of other science concepts that can be taught using a range of stories, um, weather stories. There's a lot of really good, like, especially like thunder and lightning stories, um, which are really fun to get together with your music teacher and use some percussion instruments mm -hmm. and play with that too. Like we have an awesome music teacher here that Make was really immersive. Yeah. That was able to do some of that with our kids. So, um, yeah, like I, these are great, great stuff. So there's, I'm convinced that there's nothing mm -hmm. that cannot be taught with a story. Yes. <laughs> so Wait, can I say something real quick before yeah. we move to the last slide? Yeah. I also just want to add, uh, this presentation is for people uh, in science, but there's also <laughs> tons. I'm more of a social studies person. There's tons of social studies connections you can make too. All right. So we have been talking about how to use the stories to start getting at these, this indigenous knowledge um, that's been passed through generations. But what else does indigenous ways of knowing, what else does decolonizing your classroom look like? Well, we as Western science and all of y'all have done citizen science, you cannot lie. Um, all of us that, that are Western scientists, we love to measure, we love to count, we love to record data and share every bit of that data. Um, but could there be more to science, right? Could there be more to being a scientist? Um, how data is collected and how knowledge is shared is a big part of decolonizing your classroom or looking at indigenous ways of knowing as pedagogy. Um, 
there's a big focus on non-standard measurement. As you can see, Ogana, our student here in this picture, he does not have a ruler in his hand, um, but he came back and was able to tell me about 12 different comparisons about the size of that dandelion, things that it compared to, things that were bigger than it, things that were smaller, things that uh, other ones that were the same, other dandelions that were the same, but may have been different sizes, how it compared to himself, um, just any kind of non-standard measurement, um, careful observations and open-ended questions. And that doesn't just mean for uh, students, that means for teachers also. Uh, we have to be okay with not knowing and kind of exploring together. It's that phenomena, it's that wonder that, um, that you're looking for. That's what leads to further observations, which leads to more questions. Um, not just shutting it down with, well, yes, this is the answer, or no, that's not the answer. Um, and we, that's another thing, especially us as like naturalists and scientists, we love to just be like, oh yes, I know that, here you go. Um, but you have to be able to discuss and explore. Um, and then communication, understand that not every a bit of scientific knowledge is communicated in the same way, that there are lots of stories that can communicate, um, that there are songs that can communicate science, that there are dances that can communicate science, that there's art that communicates science, just like Chris was saying at the beginning of this. Like there are all those pieces um, that can be ways to still communicate scientific, observable understandings and concepts. Okay, so just some suggestions, um, recommendations for integrating Indigenous stories into your lessons. First, find out what tribes are near where you teach, whether it's in North Carolina or somewhere else across the U.S., and reach out to them first to see if they have a storyteller who could come in person to your class or your setting. If they do not, then ask them for resources that have accurate retellings of their stories before reaching out to tribes outside of your area. For example, in Western North Carolina, Cherokee culture is very, very relevant, but that may not be the case. If you live in the Piedmont area, uh, which is closer to the Catawba tribe um, or in other parts of the state with other state tribes, like if you live on the coast, you know, the Lumbee tribe is going to be the closest tribe to your region. This makes the storytelling more relevant to your students because you can say this story that uh, or this tribe that this story comes from is still here today, is still around today. If you have to retell the story yourself, don't try to imitate or copy an indigenous storyteller. Always tell the students that this is how it was told to you and who told you the story and what tribe they were from. Whenever I share stories, I always say you are welcome to share this story, but just make sure to give credit to the storyteller and the tribe. Do not tell the students that the stories are myth, folk tales, or fiction, because these stories are very real to indigenous people. When I use these stories with my students, I don't explicitly tell them that these stories are real or fiction because I feel like to do that would be disingenuous to my ancestors. Of course, I have second graders, so they don't really ask a lot of questions about, is this true? <laughs> Did this really happen? You know, but I don't disclose that information to them. I just, I tell them the story and we do our lessons and our activities related to it. And I just leave it at that. Do you have anything you want to add before then? Mm, I don't think so. So why does this matter? Why would you want to integrate Indigenous stories into education? Teaching students about science through Indigenous storytelling opens our students' eyes to different ways of knowing and different methods of transmitting knowledge. We are decolonizing education by showing our students that the Western colonial education model is not the only model for learning. We are encouraging our learners to think about the world in a different way, one that inspires wonder. We are preparing learners for a larger world, one that extends far beyond the reaches of colonization, one where they might one day encounter other ways of knowing. They will be better equipped for these experiences because of the exposure they had to decolonized education methods. 
So uh, a little bit of information about this photo here. Um, I included it because I think it really encapsulates what decolonizing education does for Indigenous students. A few years ago, I did a unit on sacred Cherokee places, which culminated in a trip to Clingman Stone, which is a very sacred place to my tribe. I took second graders and first graders what? on the bypass trail <laughs> to Clingman Stone. And it was freezing when we got to the top. So all of my second graders were kind of huddled together for warmth. And while uh, we were standing there, I realized, you know, with, with all my all of my Cherokee students, I'm Cherokee, uh, looking all around at the 360 degree view you have uh, at Clean and Stone. And I said, everything you can see, everything you can see from this point belong to our ancestors. And I really think that decolonized education just it shows our students how big the world can be. We just say first and second graders, she took up the bypass trail. Okay. They had to carry their own lunch and everything. If you know, you know, that's all. Um, the, the one other thing I want to say before we end all this is that like, this is not, we are not setting this up as an us or them kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, this is absolutely like just opening another door. Mm -hmm. It is not, it's just saying, ah, we need to stretch our arms and legs a little bit and see what all is out there. Um, yeah. <laughs> just to add to, um, I know that one of the big things in teaching pedagogy right now is making global citizens. And so what does global citizenship look like? I think that in integrating, you know, indigenous knowledge is going to help us create these global citizens. Well, and that's really what it comes down to. Like, if you're watching this right now, you understand that our planet is facing problems that are way too big to be solved by just one point of view. Mm -hmm. So the more points of view that we have, the more answers, the more ideas we have to pull from, to start to, to solve our planet's crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, the problems we have these days are just too big for one, for one point of view. Mm -hmm. That's all. So, so this is, uh, again, this is us. Oh, this is our, this. this is our contact information. Um, real quick, before we take questions, I am going to do a shameless plug because I'm super proud. And Caitlin was one of my contributors mm -hmm. on this piece also. So I was lucky enough to get to be a Science Friday educator. Um, if any of you guys watch or listen to the Science Friday podcast, um, I am one of their educator collaborators and was, if you are interested in diving deeper into pedagogy in the classroom and what that looks like, um, the educator guide that goes with this resource is very rich with um information and really exact like kind of how to what does this look like in a traditional like this is specifically written at middle school level but um so go check that out also if you want to again that's your deeper dive right there um and i hope you'll check that out and this is us all right questions comments concerns everybody let's give jessica and Caitlin, a great big round of applause. What a fantastic job. Thank you so much uh, for sharing the stories and ways to use them in classrooms, the way that you've used them in classrooms. Um, and I actually love that you included advice on uh, how educators, teachers, or just people out there in the community can incorporate stories and storytelling uh, and appropriate ways to do that. That kind of advice that it, it's you can't just like google that easily yeah so that's wonderful <laughs> advice to get from the two of you thank you very much so yeah hey everybody uh drop your questions into the chat if you haven't already because that's where i'm headed right now to get your thoughts for our two guests so it sounds like you're ready um and the first question that came into the chat is from sue metz that's which i think mom. comes with like a a wink <laughs> you can answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> she's actually uh, and, a watch party 
<laughs> okay. Well, hey, Sue, drop everybody's questions into the chat. Uh, and and also tell us all the good stories. Or, or not? Yeah. Okay. Here's the question. What is the connection between stories and religious beliefs? I'm going to let Waisha take that one. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think about how to phrase this. Uh, this is what I feel comfortable saying. Um, there is a connection there, but I don't feel like I am the person to discuss that further. Is that okay? Is that I think it is. And what I will say yeah, is absolutely. that the stories that we use are stories that have been vetted and have been shared again and again and again. There are some stories that, and some knowledge that is not to be shared, mm -hmm. um, especially like, and there's stories and knowledge that can be shared with Waisha, with Caitlin, because she is Cherokee and that will never be shared with me. And that's okay. Like, that's just part of understanding um, the concepts. But I, I, I thought, I think of, I thought of a way to kind of phrase it. So, you know, we use the word sacred a lot and we talk about, you know, what something is, if it is what sacred means and things that are sacred. And I will say that stories are sacred, you know, in the same way that, you know, water is sacred or, um, you know, aspects of other religions are, are sacred, you know, something to be held in high esteem and taken care of. I hope that kind of answers the question. I think very well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Kim wants to know if we can get a book list after the presentation. Absolutely. We're going to make, we're making a Google doc with links to all of our favorite resources. Yeah. We were talking about that when we were practicing and we were like, man, we, you know, but we want to make sure that we have a whole variety of stuff on there. We will share out a Google doc. Chris, I don't know like what the best way is maybe to share that. Or if you, if watcher, if viewers, if you want it, just email us and say, send us the list or mm -hmm. add us to the list and we'll send you the Google doc. That would be a great way for people to do it, to reach out to you directly. Um, you're also welcome to share that with me uh, and the Office of Environmental Education. And we can make that available to people if they uh, forget these emails, but remember us. Since we're here every week, they can find us and, and we can have that available for them too. I'm sure the folks in the EE office will be more than happy to make that resource available to folks. Uh, let's see. Carol wants to know if you can recommend any stories about protecting our environment. Um, off the top of my head. My, I feel like the Akhenati and Shalu story gets at that a little bit. So she's referring to the first man, first woman story. Um, Akhenati was the hunter and um, Shalu was the corn mother. And it's kind of the balance, keeping the balance between not just male and female, but between plants and animals and between the environment. Um, I, right now, honestly, like I am so in love with the Water Protectors book. If you guys don't know that book, um, it is not a Cherokee story, but it is direct information kind of about um, how, and that was on one of our slides too. It'll be on the resource mm -hmm. list, but it's really nice kind of information about how that idea of conservation mm -hmm. and um, standing up for what's right in indigenous lands mm -hmm. for the ancestors, those kinds of connections. Um, there is a story about how um, we receive medicine and it is directly about the impact of humans on wildlife mm -hmm. and also how important it is to preserve and take care of plants. There's several stories too that I'm thinking of like the underground panthers and things like that, mm -hmm. where there's fluidity between the animal world and the human world that would be a good jumping off point for, um, for starting to talk about, well, what's the difference between the animal's world and the human's world and where do they intersect and why do, why are both important? Why do both need to be conserved? Mm -hmm. So that's some ideas just off the top of our head. 
That's excellent. Excellent answering. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Um, Katie's got a couple of questions. The first one was, how do you recommend connecting with local indigenous communities? So, um, again, it just depends on where you were, I, where you are. Um, I know that, like, the, I'm pretty sure the Kohari tribe is also close to, like, the Raleigh area. Um, I know they have a tribal center near there. I, you could reach out to them. Um, if you are in Western North Carolina, of course, you can email Jessica or I, but you can also reach out to the, the Museum of the Cherokee Indian. Um, the Museum of the Cherokee Indian would probably be the best resource for you to reach out to here if you don't reach out to one of us. Um, and then I'm trying to, there's Can I get another there? group. Yeah. Um, talk to your local universities. Mm -hmm. Um, most universities have a native American student organization, yes. um, which is a good way to connect to people. And, um, a lot of, uh, I think that's a good way. Um, also North Carolina has eight state recognized tribes. Um, all of that information is on the NCpedia, which is through the North Carolina History Museum. Mm -hmm. um, so they can also, they, most of those, I think, connect to the actual tribal site as well um, so that you can talk to whichever tribes. They've got nice maps and stuff, too, of where the tribes can be found, what the local areas are. So, and then I know that if you're outside of North Carolina, a lot of, I know the Eastern Band has a website, um, but a lot of tribes actually have their own websites that you can go to. Like I know the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, their website has a ton of language resources, a ton of um, cultural resources on there. Um, so even just checking the tribal website um, of the tribe that you're uh, looking to get in touch with could be helpful. Excellent advice. Uh, and sounds like that would be the the good and right way to try to find storytellers too to invite into community centers or classrooms. Yes. I would say the same thing, yeah, probably. Start there. Ask around. Yeah. <laughs> it's building trust though too. Mm -hmm. Like it's knowing your mm -hmm. community like knowing who's in your backyard, you know, knowing whose ancestors land you're on, mm -hmm. like understanding that. So then you can, can connect to that and, and, you know, in a respectful way, mm -hmm. tell them you're an educator, make sure that you understand that you don't know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like just mm -hmm. be honest about that. That is the number one way I have learned in Cherokee is to know that I don't know that, you know, I come, I joke that I come from, you know, root eating, beer drinking people in Europe, that I am not indigenous. And so I am lucky enough to have good friends that I can ask questions of. Um, but that's, you know, building trust and building community and knowing who you are so you can explore, you know, the community around you. Mm -hmm. too. Excellent, excellent stuff. Okay, uh, let's see the next one. What concerns are there with telling creation stories? Uh, a viewer was told once to not tell them in the summer so as to not have animals stop what they are doing to listen. Never heard that, but I, I love it. personally <laughs> have not heard that. That's awesome, though. <laughs> but as a native person who is who you know has been told to, who has been told some stories um and who is kind of familiar with like the the expectations and the rules um you have to really kind of like feel the information that you receive and if you have information that you heard from one person you can double check that with a few other storytellers or a few other people from that tribe that that story is from, and then go from there based on um, what feedback you received. I have learned that lesson the hard way several times. Um, just know that no two people, mm -hmm. just like with any culture, just like with anybody, no two people are going to hear information or learn information or have the exact same understandings. Um, and so 
one thing I will say about that, as far as the seasonal thing, mm -hmm. is that traditionally winter was the time of storytelling. Um, I know a lot of First Nations tribes uh, celebrate February as like a storytelling month um, for that reason. That winter was the time when you were in your winter house and mm -hmm. it was freaking cold and you're not going outside and you're not busy in the garden and, and those kinds of things. So time was spent with, you know, storytelling. And so I know traditionally winter would be the most prevalent storytelling time, but, but there are stories for every season. Mm -hmm. There are stories that switch between seasons. Mm -hmm. That's the underground Panther story again. Like he switches between seasons and yeah. it's very wonky and wonderful. So, um, but yeah, I would say just always vet it through several sources. Even mm -hmm. if you vet it through 10 people, you know, you may still present information that somebody else heard differently. But I think that's, that's the telephone game of life that we play. Yeah. You know? <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Donna's got an interesting comment about scientific knowledge. She writes used in stomp dances. Um, that's not something that uh, I can really talk about in a public forum. That's kind of, that's kind of close information. Sure. Sounds good. One thing right. I will say, was that Donna Beck? I don't know. Oh, okay. One thing I will say is that um, public and social dances um, that can be performed mm -hmm. um, are oftentimes excellent sources of science too, especially again, going back to those animal stories, like how much do I love those animal stories? But the bear dance in particular, like I'm thinking in Cherokee, mm -hmm. is a wonderful representation of, um, which is a social dance, a male-female dance. Um, and it's a wonderful representation of the different ways, the different behaviors of the bear. Part of the dance, they're like scooping berries off the ground. Part of it, they're like trotting through the woods. Part of it, they're like growling and defending against each other. Um, the if you watch some of the dances like the um, quail dance i love the quail dance also that's one of those that you can tell that there was direct observation of how quails behave um they will not go over the log they have to go around the log and that's exactly what happens in the mm -hmm. dance um and if you want people to come perform those dances and you are local to Western North Carolina, you can actually reach out to the warriors of Onagadua and they will come in and do those dances um, for your school with your students. So, but they're again, great science mm -hmm. also, again, like Caitlin said, like talking about mm -hmm. the observations have been made for thousands of years mm -hmm. and have been translated into song and dance and story. Mm -hmm. And they're a lot of fun. I always do them with my kids. Yeah. I've done them, you know, like, probably hundreds of times now, but I still always do it with them whenever we have somebody come and do the dances. The ant here. dance where you yeah. have your little like ant antennas. <laughs> so fun. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. I love that. Pop in the frog dance and make the frog noise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's so impressive that uh, all the ways that you talked about these, uh, these perspectives on the natural world that just gives so, so much more than, um, you know, Western sciences, peer reviewed publications, for example, mm -hmm. you know, like collecting data is important. Sure. And, and science, science is important as a, as a way of knowing, but it's not the only way of knowing. It's not especially, necessarily just empirical. You know, we think a lot about empirical knowledge, it doesn't always have to be empirical. Exactly. And uh, for, for how many decades and centuries did Western science try to separate things like uh, culture and humanity from this enterprise that we call capital S science mm -hmm. and, and never truly achieved that, right? Like so many of our negative biases and implicit biases just worked their way into capital S science over centuries. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to almost become part of the process in so many ways. And in that process, push so many people out of, uh, you know, what we think of as the, you know, like modern scientific enterprise. And that, yeah, when, if we can just sort of like holistically incorporate uh, 
culture into this enterprise, then we get to bring everybody along with us, mm -hmm. right? It, it doesn't become something that only one group of people has done in history, you know, in, in the, the way that we tell those stories. Mm -hmm. it's, it's something for everybody. Yes. Because it doesn't mean just one thing. Anyway, uh, so it was lovely to have you. <laughs> Thank you for so having me. I'm looking at the clock. Uh, there, there were more questions here in the chat. Um, if you still have that slide with your email addresses up, we'll go out on that. If you can put that back up on the screen okay. share. Uh, that way, folks who have more of these questions can reach out to you uh, and, and get those resources from you in order to enrich their classrooms and their programs and their educational endeavors. Hey, I'm pulling and in the meantime, up. that's great. Uh, while you're doing that, I'll remind everybody that the Lunchtime Discovery Series happens every Wednesday at noon, uh, except for next Wednesday at noon in advance of the, the holiday. We won't be here, but we will be here the week after that, which will be the first day of December, I believe. So I hope that we'll see you back here in the month of December for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. You can get more information about this program by following the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education online. Their website is eenorthcarolina.org, and you can find them on Twitter at North Carolina EE. And of course, the Museum of Natural Sciences is at Natural Sciences on all social media platforms, and naturalsciences.org also has information about this lecture series as well. Just check out the calendar of events for links and details on upcoming programs. Uh, there's the email addresses, everybody. Get those jotted down. Uh, Jessica, Caitlin, thank you so much for being with us today. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you for the invite. We appreciate you. Ski, then dog you. Bye, everybody.